That's a thumbs up from David, and I welcome those that are joining us online tonight. Uh, I thank you for joining us, and we're continuing our study in the first and second Timothy. Tonight, we're looking into first Timothy chapter four. Uh, two weeks ago, and I thank Lee for filling in for me last week, but two weeks ago, we, we looked at verses one through five, and today we're going to be picking up verse six through the end of the chapter, verse six through the end of the chapter, and I've titled this session uh, about being the good servant, being the good servant. Uh, if you look at verse one, and it says, in pointing out these things to the brethren, you will be a good servant of Jesus Christ, and, and that's where I've got the title from. And understand, we're doing those things that we're called. Now, uh, that we're called to do. The, the emphasis here, we need to remember, put this back in the context. Timothy is getting instruction from Paul. Paul is telling young Timothy, understand in the Bible, young could be if you're age 40, from a youth to about age 40, you're, you're considered young. How old is Timothy here? I don't know. I imagine he's 30-ish but old com or young compared to Paul at any rate. Uh, talking to Timothy, I, uh, at our TCMA meeting today, we had um, uh, one gentleman that's there that's 23. He's going to seminary. He is uh, uh, in an, doing an internship at a sister church in the area here. And, you know, sometimes, like as we're going to read in here, uh, it says, don't let people despise your youth. And, and so we, we've got to understand where we're at, and I'm going to deal with that because, you know, a lot of times the people who despise somebody that's young isn't doing what they should be doing as an older person either. And, and we need to realize that. But here is young Timothy getting instructions. Verse 6 says, and pointing out these things. Well, what are these things? It's these things are what we were talking about two weeks ago, verses 1 through 5. The things that are coming. Let's go, let's go back and revisit that just, just very briefly here. Uh, chapter 4, verse 1, it says, But the Spirit explicitly says that in later times that some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. And we can go on and on about that. Uh, understand one of the issues here that we talked about in chapter 1 was the dealing with false teachers. Good bit of the New Testament deals with warnings about false teachers. And so, so Paul is telling them and pointing out these things to the brethren. Understand, there's a lot of falsehoods out there. Where's our truth from? Our truth is from the Word of God. And if it doesn't measure up to the Word of God, it, there's a lot of people who will tell you anything. As I've told my uh, sons before, you know, you can go on YouTube and you can find people who will preach anything about anything and, 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 will, and will proclaim it to, to be the truth. Unless it measures up to the truth of scriptures, you can't trust it. Uh, I was talking with folks today. You hear all kinds of stuff in the news. Who are you going to trust? The news is slanted. I, I was talking about, uh, there was uh, one group out there. It's a very right-leaning group. But sometimes uh, some of these right-leaning groups is just as bad as these left-leaning uh, news sources. Who are you going to believe? It, just because it's something that I agree with doesn't make it right. Uh, because they'll ex exaggerate, they put in all the emotional words, and they do all the, these things. Where is the truth in all of this? Well, Timothy says, in pointing out these things, these warnings that Paul has got, he says, to the brethren, to the church, you will be a good servant of Jesus Christ. And he says constantly, now we got to put this in the context here, constantly nourished on the words of the faith and of the sound doctrine which you have been following. Now, understand this is talking to a pastor here. It's talking to teachers. You know, uh, just because I'm a pastor, just because somebody has taught Sunday school for 50 years doesn't mean you arrived. You got to constantly, am I right? You got to be in the Word. I've got to be in the Word. Constantly. 
constantly. There's so many things that, that opposes out there. And, and, and understand, let's go back, and we talked about deacons uh, over in chapter 3. Part of the reason for deacons is to take the load off the pastor so we're not waiting tables. What was over in Acts uh, uh, 6, verses 2 and 4? And it says, so the 12 summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, it's not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. Therefore, select among you, yada, yada. And it says, but we will devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. It takes time to study the word. And, and uh, uh, I wish I could spend more time but oftentimes I'm dealt with, I have to deal with a lot of administrative issues and so on and so forth. And, and, and that's why we have deacons. But I've got to be in study so I can bring the truth. That doesn't neglect you. Just because I'm bringing you the truth doesn't mean you should neglect the word. You've got to be in the word too because one, you need to check me out. If I'm saying something wrong, you owe it to yourselves, you owe it to the church, you owe it to me to point it out. Okay? Uh, you know, there are a lot of people who will follow the preacher. No, we're not following the preacher. I'm, I'm, I'm leading you, guiding towards Jesus. We're all following him. We're following Jesus, which is the head of the church. But if all you do is got your eyes on me, you got your eyes on the wrong place uh, because I will fail you. Why? Because I'm human. I'm imperfect. I'm struggling. I'm on a journey just as you. But you need to be in the scriptures to help check me out and to keep me straight. Okay? And that's for the sake of the church. But he says, you will be a good servant of Jesus Christ, constantly nourished on the word of the faith and of the sound doctrine which you have been following. So, you know, good, good on, uh, on um, Timothy here. He's been following it. But he needs to continue to follow it. He needs to continue to be nourished here. And, and he says, but, verse 7, but have nothing to do with worldly fables fit for old women or old wives' tale, if you got the NIV. You know, there, there's, there's, there's a lot of, I'll say, garbage that is out there. And those are, uh, th those are stuff and, and you can, uh, you know, th there, there's all kinds of doctrines out there that does not have any basis in Scripture. Or uh, there are some who will build a whole theology off of a single verse and not take the whole counsel of Scripture. You've got to put it all in the context. You've got to take the whole counsel of Scripture. It's interesting. Uh, we, we've, got some, uh, we've got some interesting denominations out there that... That, that builds a, a, a whole theology on one verse out of Mark, a, a portion of Mark who's at the, at the very end that people say they're not in the oldest and more reliable Greek manuscripts, you know, talking about handling snakes and being bit by snakes. Uh, we build a whole theology on that? that You've got to take the whole... I'm not going to handle snakes. <laughs> we had a friend in Indonesia, his friend... Uh, what was it, Mel, um, what was his name, Gentry. His family owned Gatorland, and I, I, uh, I, I bragged to people. I, I knew a Baptist preacher who, whose job was handling snakes. <laughs> he didn't appreciate that, but I thought it was funny. But uh, uh, but, but any rate, we got to be careful on handling, you know, uh, as we'll read in here later, about rightly handling the Word of God. And he says, uh, but have nothing to do with worldly fables fit only for old women uh, in the NIV. Or all old wives' tales. I like the way the, uh, um, this New American Standard is what I'm reading from. The NIV has old wives' tales. But, you know, there, there, uh, there are things out there that, uh, that, uh, that deals with stuff, that deals on minutia, that, that, that doesn't make a hill of beans a difference. But, you know, a lot of people say we need to spend time studying, studying all about the Mormons and all about the uh, Jehovah Witnesses and some of these other cults and stuff that are out there. And I've used this illustration many times, and I'm going to use it again tonight. Do you know what the Treasury Department do with their Treasury agents to spot 
counterfeit money. They don't use the first counterfeit dollar to train them. They train them on the real thing. What it feels like, what it's made of, all the little lines, the watermarks. They train them on the real thing. They know the real thing forwards and backwards and up and down and against the light. They know it so well that when the false comes around, it will stand out like a sore, sore thumb. We don't need to pay attention to all this worldly stuff that's out there. We know this, forwards and backwards, up and down. And we know the truth of God as given to us by his word. We don't have to worry about the falsehood because we'll know it when it rears its ugly head because we know the truth. The problem is, and what sucks people away, is they don't know the truth. So when some charlatan comes around with a nice silver tongue and speaks all kinds of, uh, it just slides off their tongue and it, it sounds so good and sounds so right, but it doesn't measure up here, it's still going to be wrong. And we need to know the truth so we can spit it out. And so he says, don't pay any attention. Don't pay any attention to um, uh, the worldly fables fit for old women. On the, uh, on the other hand, discipline yourselves for, purpose of, uh, for the purpose of godliness. For the purpose of godliness. You know, we're... we're he, he's using words about physical exercise. You understand he's talking to Greeks here in, in Corinth. You know, they, they had the games back then, if you will, the Olympic games or whatever they called it back then. And so he's using words. He says, on the other hand, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. Verse 8, for bodily discipline is only of little profit. Now, we can look at that talking about Working out, understand, working out is good as long as you keep working out. You, you, you stop working out, your muscles go to flap, okay? It's only of limited value. But probably what's being referred to here is there are folks who tend to go the other way. You know, not necessarily going into uh, mystical doctrines and stuff like that. They look at it, and, 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 and if we go back a few verses, go back a few verses... It, 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 it's talking about those that advocate uh, no marriage and not eating certain foods, those sorts of bodily things. Those, and and as that's probably what it's being referred to here. Uh, back in verse, uh, whatever verse it was, uh, verse, uh, he says, verse 3, uh, chapter 4, verse 3, men who forbid marriage and advocate abstaining from foods which God has created, so on and so forth. Uh, he's probably talking about that. Uh, you know, uh, there, there are uh, some places out there, especially among uh, 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 Islamic groups, you know, about flogging yourself and so on and so forth, you know, and beating yourself up. And, 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 and he's saying, you know, those physical things uh, are, are of little value of little value. He says, for, uh, for bodily discipline or bodily exercise, depending upon your translations, is only of a little profit. But godliness is profitable for all things, since it holds promise for the present life and also of the life to come. Uh, we're the deal with, uh, we're, we're the deal with, um, with living godly. Now, I've been preaching on holiness for the last few weeks. And, you know, holiness is, it's something we got to work at. You know, when I was in the uh, military, when I was flying, and as a pilot, uh, one thing that we had was uh, currency requirements. I had to put in so many hours every so many days to stay current. If I, I had been out of the cockpit for a certain amount of time before I could go fly, I had to get checked out. I had to fly with an instructor uh, to get current again. Well, it's the same way in our spiritual life. Uh, we, need, we need to stay current. We need to stay at it. And you know what? When I was flying every day, and I was flying several hours every day, day after day after day, I got pretty good at what I did. 
But if all of a sudden I took leave and I was home for 30 days and I didn't do any kind of flying, I go back and I'm rusty. You know, in our, in our Christian life, similar, you know, we, we okay, I'm going to take a break. We never take a break from our lives. We practice, we work at being godly. We work at being godly because we get better at it the more we do it. We let it slack for a day or two, and we get slack, and we're rusty at it, okay? And, and he says, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. For, for uh, bodily discipline is only of little profit, but godliness is profitable for all things, since it's whole promise for the present life and also the life to come. Understand we're building up our rewards in heaven here. Verse 9, it is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance, period. Verse 10, well, what is a trustworthy statement? It's interesting to look at that in different places in Scripture. What was a trustworthy statement? The statement that came before or the statement that comes after? And we can make arguments for each. In fact, if you've got the NIV, it, it, it very clearly indicates the statement that follows. Uh, because they put it, uh, because he says in verse ten, for it is, uh, for it is for this that we labor and strive, and it's in parentheses dealing with the statement that follows there. Uh, but that's understand whether it's uh, about our 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 working for godliness is profitable for all things, or in verse ten it says, for this we labor and strive. That's our work towards godliness. Because we have fixed our hope, fixed our hope on the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of believers. Um, I can make that argument. I'm going to go there as far as which way that, uh, that trustworthy statement is. They're both good. But un understand what we're talking about here is holiness, our work uh, uh, to be godly. And says, for we have fixed our hope. Uh, let me take a break here for a second. Uh, sermon series, new one starting this Sunday, talking about uh, uh, the believer's hope, our hope as believers. And this is uh, leading up until Easter. I'm going to be going through 1 Corinthians 15 on Sunday morning, talking about our hope, our hope being the resurrection and, 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 and that aspect. But our hope is on the living God. Understand anything short of God uh, our hope is built on nothing. Everything in this life is temporal. I talked about that last Sunday. But our hope is on the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of believers. Sometimes I think that's kind of unfortunate, the way that's um, uh, worded, because here again, this is where taking the whole of Scripture in there, is God going to save everybody? No, but the potential is there. The potential is there to save everyone. I mean, we just, we just read uh, uh, back in chapter 2, chapter 2, verses 4 to 6, and he says in verse 4, it says, Who desires all men to be saved? God desires everybody to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And then verse 6, talking about Jesus, says, Who gave himself as a ransom for all? Jesus paid the penalty for everybody. But not everybody accepts it. So the potential, God is the potential Savior of all men, and he is the definite Savior of a few who believe, who believe. And so even Jesus, it's interesting, Jesus talked about those that are saved. Uh, uh, over in chapter 23 of Matthew, he, on his triumphal entry, he's coming down to Jerusalem, and he weeps over Jerusalem. And, and Jesus says in um, Matthew 23, verse 37, he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stoned those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together the way a hen gathers her chick under her wings, but you were unwilling. So people will reject the salvation that God wants to be Savior of all. Uh, and, and a verse I use all the time from, uh, from Peter to, uh, talks about he doesn't desire for any to perish, but all to come to repentance. So here he's talking to uh, 
putting us back to where we're coming from. Uh, Paul is talking to young Timothy, and he says, we're labor and striving for our godliness because we have our fixed, our hope on the living God who has the potential of saving all men and especially for believers. And so he says on the verse 11, he says, prescribe and teach these things. That was his job as pastor. That's a job for many of you as teachers. We are to teach these things. Verse 12, let no one look down on your youth, youthfulness, but rather in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity, show yourself as an example of those who believe. I don't have to expound on this a whole lot, uh, but I'm going to. Um, you know, there are some young folks out there that's got it together. Mm -hmm. They have diligently studied the Word. That doesn't mean they're there yet, but they're living, you know, they're, they're, they're walking the talk, mm -hmm. and they're talking the walk. And then there are old folks, and I preached on this a number of weeks ago, uh, that the writer of Hebrews uh, was writing to. Hebrews 5.12 says, Though by this time you ought to be teachers. Isn't it interesting that those that probably are walking the walk the least is probably saying, who are you to tell me what's right and wrong, you know? And, and, and he says, though by this time you ought to be teachers, but you, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. Um, I remember in Indonesia we had a, I don't know how old the kid was, 12, 13, 14 years old, came to know the Lord. And, and I, I don't want to go into the particulars of this, but this was a child that we cast some demons out of. Honest to goodness, uh, straight out of the Bible kind of demons we cast out. And so uh, this kid, who knew what being filled with the Spirit was because he had been filled with other spirits, quite literally, uh, Oppo. And, uh, and then hearing him pray, it blow the socks off of most folks who've been in Sunday school for 50 years. And, you know, some of the things and the wisdom that would come out of the mouth of that child. And, and, and uh, you know, and, and we need to listen to people regardless of your age. It says, don't let, don't let anyone look down on your youthfulness but rather in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity. Show yourself as an example. And so, you know, the one who is walking the talk and talking the walk, I'm going to listen to. Now, the one who isn't walking the talk, I don't care how much they talk the walk, I'm not going to listen to them, okay? So uh, uh, so he's telling, he, he, he's, he's telling uh, young Timothy here, you know, uh, you set by example, and folks will listen to you. Uh, verse um, 13, until I come, give attention to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation and teaching. We need to read the Bible to one another in public. We do so in worship, and, and then we... Exalt on it. You know, uh, uh, one of my favorite books in the Bible is the book of uh, Nehemiah. Nehemiah, uh, it's, a, it's a grand story, and actually it's, it's good to go through the book of Nehemiah and read the prayers of Nehemiah. It's, uh, uh, it's a whole study by itself. But anyway, in Nehemiah 8, verse 8, and I remember this one, uh, a professor of mine in seminary uh, taught us one day on this verse. Uh, but, it, but it said in there, it says, and they read from the book, from the law of God, translating uh, to give sense to that, so that they understood the reading. You know, it, it's, uh, we read the word, and for some people it's just gobbledygook. You know, it, 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 it doesn't make sense. And, and so, you know, you got to explain it to them. 
and, and in the context of that in Nehemiah, there's a whole list of names that I can't pronounce that comes before that. And these were the scholars who sat on the stage, you know, with, with Ezra as he was reading the word. And these were the scholars who went down among the people and explained it. I, I got a whole bunch of scholars I deal with, and they're in books. I'll call them commentaries, okay? Uh, these are guys that are way smarter than I am. Uh, and, and, and I learn from others that are way smarter. But they give sense to what they're reading. And this is, this is the job of the pastor. This is the job of teachers, is to make sense. And, and you're to study. And, and it takes time to understand and study some of this stuff. And so he says, um, he says public reading of Scripture, exhortation and teaching. Do not neglect the spiritual gift within you which was bestowed upon you through prophetic utterance with the laying on the hands of the pespery. Uh, that's a nice word for the group of elders, if you will. We, we do a similar sort of thing when we do uh, uh, ordination. You know, we do a laying on of hands uh, uh, that's mostly symbolic and so on and so forth. We're recognizing when we ordain somebody the gift that God has given them and recognizing the call that God has on their lives. But he's saying, don't neglect the gift. You know, I think one of the biggest problems of the church today is people neglecting the gift of the Spirit that they have given them. Oh, I can't teach. How do you know? Have you ever tried? And if you tried, don't expect it to be perfect, but you've got to work it out. You know, you got to exercise that gift and you got to perfect that gift and understand how to use the gift, but you got to use it. You got to do it. You know, uh, people saying, well, I, I can't teach. Well, you know, God doesn't call anybody to do anything that he doesn't gift you the ability to do. And, 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 and I think sometimes gifts are use it or lose it. And, and so we need to exercise the gift. He says, don't neglect the spirit that is within you. 2 Timothy 1.6. We're going to read this uh, when we get over into 2 Timothy. Uh, but he says, for this reason, I remind you to rekindle afresh the gift of God which is in you. And, and uh, we've got to rekindle it. You know, sometimes we've got to remind ourselves what it is that we're doing. And sometimes uh, there are those that can teach, and they know they can teach, but they're not teaching. Why? Well, nobody's asked. Well, have you asked? Uh, if, if, you're not, if, if you have the ability to teach and you're not teaching, then maybe you need to start a Bible study group. You know, heaven forbid, you can teach other days other than Sunday mornings, you know. You can get a, a group during the week. Uh, but if you've got the ability, you need to rekindle afresh that gift that is within you and use it and use it. He says in verse 15, take pains with these things. Uh, the NIV says meditate. Uh, it's interesting, the Greek word here. It's, it's talking about give over com yourselves completely to these things. You know, your spiritual gift, the, uh, uh, the exhortation and teaching of the word. Exhortation, that's just another word for preaching. Uh, give yourself over to these things. Be absorbed in them so that your progress will be evident to all. I was talking to Ellen the other day. And uh, uh, it's been a while back, but uh, she had commented, my preaching's a little better today than it was <clears throat> 12 years ago when I first came here. <laughs> it gets better with time, you know. I, 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 I'm using the gift God has given me. I, I'm not saying this because of anything that I've done, but God has allowed me to use it. And the more I use it, the better I get at it, okay? Teaching is the same way. And he says, uh, uh, be absorbed in it so that your progress is evident to all. And then in verse 16, and this is where we're going to close tonight, it says, pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Take inventory, okay? Preserve in these things... For as you do this, you will ensure salvation both for yourself and for those who hear you. Um, pay close attention. You know, uh, when, when I prepare a sermon, one thing that's very evident to me is that sermon's got to speak to me before I can speak to you. It's got to preach to me. And I've got to take inventory. 
I, I can't preach something that I'm not already doing myself. And sometimes before I, I, I sit on a sermon, uh, I got to put it off until I get myself straight on this before I can preach it. And, and, and he says, take inventory, take close attention, and to your teaching. I've got to listen to what I say. Uh, you know, I've said some pretty nice stuff. I need to listen to myself. <laughs> and I have to follow what I say, too. Okay, And the teacher is the same way. I need to listen to yourself. Yeah. Speaking of teaching, you know, and I've said this many times before, you know who learns the most in the class? It's always the teacher. The teacher is, I, I, I get, understand when I come to you with a sermon, uh, I'm, I'm only giving you that much of all of this that I've studied. And, 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 and a lot of times my problem isn't what to preach, it's what to leave out. Okay. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that I can get into, and I don't because I just don't have the time. Uh, I don't want to go, you know, a lot of it gets academic, and, 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 and some of this stuff I find fascinating. You hear me talk about, well, the Greek says this, and I can get into all the different particulars because I find it fascinating. Uh, it might be boring for most other people, but I, I, so I try and leave some of that out, and I, I, I try and stick to the main points, but understand, there's, a, a, there's an awful lot there. That I leave out. And, and, but at the same time, it says uh, uh, that you've got to pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Preserve in those things, for as you do this, you will ensure salvation both for yourself and for those who hear you. Salvation here, or in some translations, it will say you will save yourself and you will save others. Uh, it, we're not talking about salvation in terms of the word is concerned. But back in the context here, when we're talking about these bad things that are going to come down the pike that we read about in those first five verses of chapter 4, when we talk about false teachings, you know, if I stick close to the Word, I'm going to save myself from false teachings. If I preach the Word faithfully, those who hear me will be saved from false teachings and from the falsehoods that are out in the world. So we're talking about... Uh, enhancing our practical, remember, uh, our positional and practical holiness, you know. Uh, uh, we're, we're, we're dealing with our practical holiness. We're dealing with uh, uh, preserving ourselves uh, uh, vice the world. And for me, as a pastor, for many of you as teachers, that's a huge responsibility. Because we're to preserve our students and prefer preserve our congregation against all the falsehoods that are out there. And, and, and you don't believe there's falsehoods? Just turn the news on. You know, I talked about that a minute ago. What are you, what are you to believe, you know? But it's got to measure up the scripture and we've got to be in the word. And so this is the information that uh, Paul is imparting the instruction that he's imparting to Timothy here. You know, preach the word and you got to follow the word. And, uh, and, and this is a theme that we see over and over and over. Go back to verse 15. It says, take pains with these things. Be absorbed in them. In other words, you know, we get to a point and we kind of plateau. <laughs> If you plateau, you're probably starting to decline. We're always growing. I am not there yet. I, I, I'm, 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 I like to think I'm a little better than I was a year ago, and I like to think next year I'm going to be a little better than I am right now. You know, and I'm, I'm reaching that. You know, I, I forget what lies behind, but I'm striving for what's ahead and what God has, uh, what Jesus has called me for, has called you for, and uh, uh, we're on a journey. Let's, let's, we need to take pains, we need to meditate these things, we need to be absorbed in these things so that our progress is evident all. Get into chapter 5 next week. Let me go ahead and close us in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word, and Lord, May we do more than just read your word, 
And even as we attempt to understand it and, and, and absorb it, Lord, may we live your word. Lord, may we be so filled with your truth that when the falsehoods come, it will be very evident to us. May we be filled with your truth. Lord, as we leave this place, we carry your truth to an unbelieving world, a world that is dying, and Lord, that desperately needs your word. Lord, may we be faithful with what you have entrusted us with, with the gospel of Jesus Christ to a lost world. Lord, be with us, guide us, direct us, empower us to do your will. And may Jesus be glorified, for it's in his holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. We'll see you Sunday. See you Sunday.